Hey Atari Hackers, welcome to the Atari Hacker Podcast. In this episode, we are going to be talking about how to pick a niche in 2023. I know a lot of you guys are going to be interested in starting new websites this year, and a lot has changed in the SEO industry. So we're going to be mostly focusing on what has changed and how we would do things differently from 2022. So let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome to the Atari Hacker Podcast. This is the first podcast of 2023. And as usual, we are going to be following a format that we do every year, which is, you know, what makes a good niche in 2023? How does niche research change, etc.? And we're doing this podcast format at this time of the year because usually people in their New Year's resolution have, I need to start a site this year. I, I was supposed to do this two years ago, then I didn't do it last year, and now I finally need to do this. And so we decided to actually go for that format and actually to kind of like help people that want to do that. We're actually discounting the authority site system right now, which is our training on starting new sites. You can go and find the current discount on authorhacker.com slash system. It is only going to be running for a few days, so don't miss it out. But now let's jump into the podcast. Uh, but before that, Mark, how is 2023 going? 2023 is going great and this is definitely not filmed in 2022 um so yeah great so how great was your new, new year's year eve exactly like oh fan fantastic yeah um yeah oh, many memorable events too too many to recount uh-huh okay fair enough you don't you don't drink as well so it's like that it's surprising that we don't get much more details but okay. most likely i'm going to, i mean this is obviously filmed <laughs> in 2022 at the end of the year it takes us a few days to film publish edit all this um but yeah i i'm hoping to be in bed by quarter past 12 on new year's eve How because sad. i'm old so how sad uh, okay let's let's talk about less sad things and let's talk about what makes a good dish in 2023 um and so uh let's just like yeah let's talk about like how we like to do things i think the first thing i want to talk about is that um 2023 i think uh, i mean 2022 has been the year of really fast growth of uh, ad networks like mediavine ad thrive etc they have been even releasing like kind of like premium tiers with even higher payouts and so on like it's been really developing you could argue it's been developing for a few years but i think it's really consolidated uh, in the last year. And so because of that, um, when we pick a niche this year, I'd say compared to maybe if you listen to this podcast last year, I'd say put a lot more emphasis on ads and kind of mix ads and affiliate together, kind of like in a way to achieve this kind of like topical relevancy, right? So if you want to cover your topic, some of the keywords are going to talk about products in your niche. Some of the keywords are going to talk about, uh, you know, how to use the products or how to like, you know, like, um, tips and tricks and maintenance and things like that, basically info content. And you can really make that info content really well monetized with ads now, and then your commercial content with affiliate. But you know, before it was more difficult to make good money from info content. So people would tend to like overweight the amount of uh, commercial content they would make because that would be the way you make money early on. Now, I think provided you can get into one of the good ad networks, I mean, I guess the, the, the kind of scale of how it goes is like Azoic at the beginning, because they don't really have a traffic cap. Then you have Mediavine at 50K and you have AdStrive at 100K or 30K for your secondary sites. Um, essentially, yeah, like you can put a lot more info content. And when I pick a niche, I would definitely go more towards uh, info content than I would have recommended if you listen to this podcast one or two years ago, basically. I think as well, the, the, because so many big publishers have been going into affiliate reviews because there's been a ton of money to make in it, the competition level has just gotten you know harder and harder. Whereas, of course, info content's gotten more competitive too, but not as much as the the growth in competition and affiliate has been. Yeah, it's it's like yeah. So it's like especially when you're like starting a new site, you don't have a lot of authority, etc. Like while it was realistic in a lot of niches to kind of like compete early on, it's more difficult these days. It doesn't mean you'll never be able to compete, etc. But you know, like I like the idea of growing my site to the R twenty thirty. Uh, and then kind of like go for these bigger affiliate keywords. I feel like you get results faster at least. Um, that's my personal approach of how I would approach picking a niche this year compared to how I did this before, basically. The second one I wanted to talk about is recession proof because uh, I can't predict the future. This is not uh, investment advice, <laughs> like, you know, like all this, the legal disclaimers, but it would be likely that the economy would slow down in 2023, at least for the first half, I would say. Um, and so usually when the economy slows down, people spend money differently. And so, 
you know, there might not be as much money spent on like drone cameras and things like that. And people will probably spend more into core needs. So kind of like the way, like I, I kind of wrote down two frameworks people can use to um, brainstorm niches. The first one is something you've probably seen because you went to business school. Or to, it's like Maslow pyramid of needs, you know, it's like you have these kind of like people need to meet their core needs. So before you buy a, a fancy drone, you probably need a, a place to stay first. Uh, then you need something to eat. And after that, maybe you'll consider the drone basically. So the idea is that you need to cover your basic needs first before you actually go to the next needs. And when there's a recession, people tend to regress back to the more basic needs. So yeah, they, you don't stop buying food. You stop buying exactly expensive stuff you don't really need. So and so when you pick a niche, it's important, right? Because like a lot, of, like the, especially in early days for your site, people are going to be spending money differently, most likely. So for example, like the the base base level of that pyramid is the physiological needs, right? So that would be need for shelter, need for food, need for like all the really like surviving stuff, basically. So like I put some examples of niches in there. For example home improvement I put, but like I also put focus on energy efficiency because uh, currency, like all the current currently, like, you know, energy is very expensive in most countries in the world. And so if I had any, a home improvement site, I would be doubling down on like how to isolate your windows, uh, how to like, um, is it worth changing your windows? When is it worth changing? Uh, how to isolate a wall, how to like things like that, that uh, would be informational keywords. Solar panels. Yeah. So like thing anything like that. that reduces your bills, basically, like uh, do you, should you install batteries in your house when you have solar panels, uh, things like that. Like, is it what, like these kind of info keywords are most likely going to do well. So like you could be covering something like this, for example, that would work quite well. Start with this during the session, then kind of expand to like other areas of home improvement later on. Uh, if the economy gets better, basically. I put sleep as well. Obviously, it's not an easy niche sleep, um, but everyone's going to still buy mattresses and still going to need to sleep and still going to need a bed. Uh, so I think that's going to be a good one. Uh, same, I, I put like some cooking niches. So I took an example of real life because Mark came to uh, to Portugal last week at the time at which we're recording. And I have this like cooking machine called Thermomix that he wasn't convinced by. Um, I use that and there's actually a big community around this. And I think if someone actually used that, basically it's a machine that's like a blender, cooking, steaming, pretty much doing everything. And you just follow recipes on some kind of an iPad in front of it. Uh, but like being a content creator in this niche, for example, there's like a, there's a lot of people that have this device that talk about this on social media. There's these big Instagram accounts and so on. And it's like, you could start there and people start even like recipes, books and things like that for people to follow. I, I would argue though, so, you know, you've, you've put that under a basic necessity. Okay. You're but, right uh, on that. Yeah, actually like that thousand, is a good point. $500 product that, it depends. that does what like, your blender does already. So people did that, bought a lot of this during COVID, etc. So, but I agree the circumstances are a bit different. So I, I understand the argument here. I just tried to find some kind of like a very niche sub niche because like the problem is like, if you just say cooking, people are going to be like, oh, it's very difficult. And it is, right? There's lots of established players. They're really good. It's hard to compete. But if you pick like a really small sub niche, like based on like a device with like uh, a community, etc., like you might actually be able to find an audience in that niche and then you expand later basically and that's kind of where I took it but I take your argument I think that's a good one uh, and then uh, the next level of the pyramid is like safety needs so here I put like home security for example so like you know online cameras like you can sell subscriptions on these things uh, smart locks are a big thing as well that kind of stuff I think that works quite well alarm systems anything like that I put online security and I put also anything that is to do with job career so like helping people be freelancers for example people are going to be looking for like extra sources of income if they uh, have like if they need more money because the bills are higher or if they're like worried for their jobs things like that so uh, like a, a site around that would probably do quite well uh, in the upcoming economy and that's those things I would consider at least it would ponder my decision when I pick a niche right it's like it shouldn't be everything but it should be something I would consider and you have the third level which is love and belonging so it'll be like relationships and I put a bunch of like very classic niches so I put get your ex back which has always been a very big niche in dating like people buy all sorts of methods to get their ex back uh, divorced obviously big as well people have money problems it's possible uh, dating in general like dating tips etc people might still be spending on that while they might be scaling back on the other stuff and then I think you put pets yeah because it's one of the things that you just don't stop spending money on your pet regardless of, you spend less uh, do you think you your know, dog gets well. less good food during a recession no uh, I, I think it's very easy to cut back on your own 
food expenses, you know, going for the cheaper brand than the more expensive one. But generally, you don't want to change what your your dog or your pets are, are eating. It's the same. So, yeah, you know, I think quite, that. quite quite well documented that people don't cut back pet expenses during a recession, though they may cut back getting a new pet. They may delay that until till later. Yeah. Uh, so that's the first framework. That's kind of like this Maslow pyramid. But there's the other one to think about is this house wealth relationship. Basically, any sub niche of these three niches tends to do well in a recession because, again, they're like kind of like core needs, etc. So I think check these two things and then just ask yourself what is is the where is the niche that I picked fitting into there, and that usually gives you a good idea on how to pick a niche that is more recession proof, is less likely to be taking wide swings of uh, earnings because people are spending their money differently. Again, I can't say 100% there will be a big recession, but it, it could be likely. The next point is to generally try and avoid competing with big publishers. So that's uh, maybe traditional newspapers who have realized there's not much money in selling news anymore and have gone into reviewing vacuum cleaners um, or big sites who are in very competitive spaces. Um, there's only one site in on there, which is security.org, which is not a big publisher like cnn mashable um these these types of sites. in this case like um, forbes cnet tom's guide tech radar these guys basically yeah so you, you're competing against those sites who are just brute forcing their way in with their their domain authority and it's it's impossible for we had an example of uh, vpn mentor which is one of the best um sites out there in in any niche uh, in any any affiliate site very well put together huge domain authority they have some just incredible uh link acquisition campaigns through some of the stuff we're doing we've talked about them on this po the podcast before they're not even there um, i would argue so, i went to check their best vpn page it's not their best page to be honest uh, so like for that query i would say okay but like yeah compare tech or like all the other big ones as well they're not there they are, they dedicate the entire domain on this topic. And the thing is like, it's like, it's funny, I posted this on Twitter, right? And then people are like, oh, but uh, it's because all these VPN sites are recommending spammy stuff and they're like, uh, they're shit, etc. Therefore, Google is punishing them. And I was like, guys, go on PC Mag or something. They recommend the same products. <laughs> I'm in the same order and everything. It's not like they're not like they're less corrupted yeah. or anything. And they're they're not <laughs> testing them as well as some of these special exactly. VPN sites that have really built like their own testing platforms and things to to really put them through their paces. So. Exactly, and that's the thing. It's like if you if the outcome was different and it was actually like okay, they're recommending cheaper products that do the same thing, and it's like it's better for the user, etc. Yeah, I could I could agree with Google, but that that now, is not the case. Don't you think though? There's an argument to be to be made that we shouldn't just avoid competing with these these sites, but maybe on that high level, high traffic keyword. But if we drill down a few levels below, you know, best VPN for such and such a device in such and such a country, you know, they're not going to be competing um, at, at that kind of level because they don't have the. It's going to be too expensive. It's going to be too expensive for them to create content uh, depends on the niche yeah. in a vpn niche specifically actually they compete on longer tail queries as well for smaller niches it's less likely they would be here so i think it it's up to you to do the right job with your niche research and basically you need to do a fair amount of keyword research before you pick a niche just to get an idea of that it, it just reminds me of you know when i got into to online marketing back in the day and uh i was always looking for that niche that no one had discovered yet. And <laughs> that was a terrible idea because there's no money in it. So there is an element of, you know, follow the money and that will lead you to a promising niche. You just got to balance that with, you know, uh, assessing the competition on uh, from those big publishers. Yeah, it's a bad idea to have no competition. But what you're looking for is you're lo looking for competition. You can be competing with in like one, two years, basically. I, I think that's kind of like what you're looking at when you pick a niche. And then usually what that means in practical terms in HRS metrics, that would be sites between the uh, 20 and 50 ranking on page one, getting decent traffic. Like that would be kind of like what I would be looking at. If, if there's like sites that look like they're built by independent, like they don't have a crazy amount of development as well. They're like WordPress sites that they are 20 to 50 and they're doing quite well. Then I'm like, yeah, I can do this too, provided I put the right amount of effort and I put things together and I get the right team, etc. It's it's doable. So that's kind of like what I'm looking for. But if like everyone's DR90 on page one, it's it's you know, these are like seven, eight, ten years 
and day for us to to be committing. Or you know, spending millions on um, on on the content and marketing. Efforts, yeah, right? but it's not Which just that. Really realistic. If it takes this long, like you have no idea what the market's gonna be like by the time you're actually competing, and so like you just can't. Like I mean, very few people can afford it to start with. Um, but you just can't. It's, it's like even uh, if I, if I had the limited money, that would be a terrible investment, I think. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what you're looking for. And so like you're looking for a reasonable amount of competition, but you want some competition. I think it's good that you highlighted that. Another thing that I would change this year is a new, is I would pick a niche where I can have EEAT. It's not EAT now, it's EEAT. They actually added an extra E to it. Uh, they're not dyslexic at Google. Uh, they actually said on the uh, Google Search Central blog, EEAT or double EAT, <laughs> um, which I think is a bit of a strange terminology for something because it's like it's a double E, but then there's a single AT. So it doesn't, I don't know, I feel like it doesn't really quite work. Yeah, it's it's a terrible, terrible name. I think they tried to Brian Dean their EAT thing, but it didn't work. Uh, Brian Dean was better at it. Uh, anyway, um, the thing is like, but I like this because basically the extra E, so EAT original is expertise, expertise, authority, trust, which feels like there's kind of like a, it, you, your gatekeep, but like you cannot be an expert unless you have like a degree, for example, right? It's like, but now they added the, the extra E, which is experience, which feels a lot more accessible to a lot more people to be qualified about something, right? So it's like, Maybe I don't have a degree in, uh, pff, I don't know, like uh, paintball. <laughs> Let's go to paintball. But I can be playing paintball every Saturday for fun. And all of a sudden, now I fit within that definition, despite the fact that I don't own a field. And I'm like, you know, I didn't do any crazy competitions and I'm not recognized in the field as that, etc. If I've been doing this for like 10 years every Saturday, just playing paintball with my friends, now I fit in their definition of like, that kind of content that they want to reward. And for me, um, what that does, it unlocks that as something feasible for a lot of site builders, where it was a little bit, there was a bit more gatekeeping in a previous definition of EAT. And so for me, like, you know, it kind of like combines together with the growth of uh, AI, et cetera. And we'll probably talk about this a little bit later, but my idea is that eventually the way you find content online, you get AI generated content that will be generated by Google themselves or something like this, generic question answers. And then they'll be surrounding it with essentially authentic content, like stuff that shows people doing it in real life, that shares their real life experience, et cetera. So you kind of like bring that balance, right? And it's, I feel like this kind of converges together, this AI effort with EAT together. It's like eventually people creating authentic content mixed with AI content will create the best experience for users. Uh, and so if you want to future-proof any kind of business you're building, in my opinion, this year is the year where I would not ignore this anymore. When EAT came out at the beginning, I was like, ah, you know what? Sounds like a wishful thinking from Google, et cetera. Um, but over time, we're seeing sites that are doing more authentic stuff tend to do better or tend to be more stable, at least in the updates. Um, and so, and mixed with the fact where of like AI growing so much and the progress we've made recently, it does seem like just being a generic content farm. I mean, I don't think it's a 20 year, a 20 year plan basically. So if you want to build like a really long term site, I think you need to bring authenticity to your content. And because they broadened up the definition, it's more realistic to do this basically. So I have a specific question on this. Um, if we take um, weight loss, for example, mm -hmm. or like kind of fitness, um, very popular niche, you know, it's one of the things you mentioned, health, health, wealth relationships under there. So it might be something people are considering. Now, I think there's been a bit of a perception that, you know, you need to either be like a doctor or a you know, personal trainer or like someone qualified in that sense. Under this new definition, if you're just someone that works out and has gotten themselves in really good shape. Yeah, you're fine. Kind yeah. of by themselves, you now fall under this banner. So. Does I that imagine there will be tears. People, or? I imagine there will be tears, right? So if you're trying to answer like how to balance your hormone levels, maybe you want something that someone that is actually uh, an expert in that topic. So you'd probably want a doctor for that. But like, if you want the like experience on like how much do you need to walk to lose one kilo per month or something, then then maybe someone who's done it 
is maybe even more qualified than a doctor who really like is overweight themselves you know <laughs> that happens yeah. um and so yeah i read some crazy yeah. statistic that like there's an absurd percentage of doctors who yeah like, they're even healthy yeah and yeah yeah um despite supposedly knowing better it's weird that yeah so anyway so like i like i like because it opens it, it opens it up to you you could be doing weight loss content based on your experience i think you need to know your boundaries based on that and I, and i'm curious to see how granular the application of that in real life is going to be because for now it's just a definition of a blog post but if they tend to that eventually i think they will get something close to that hopefully and then in that case then then yeah i would be less worried about going for these topics and so if I'm starting a niche in 2023, I'm like, okay, how do we implement this kind of like authenticity in there? Or like, how can I start living the lifestyle, right? You don't have to have the lifestyle when you start, but you can take the point of view of a beginner that does this, etc. cetera. Uh, and I think that is uh, something that is important. And actually that goes exactly with my next point, which is I would go past, past site building. So if you're going through the effort of like, kind of like experiencing your niche, right? Um, I think there's big opportunities, not just on building your site, but on social media, right? So like you can start sharing, you know, TikToks and Instagrams and every, like you can start creating more content than just put the stuff you put on your site and, and kind of like, it's not going to help your rankings, but it's more like there's lots of growth opportunities on these other platforms these days. And they're not, it's not just Google. So I'm just thinking from a pure growth perspective, um, if you're going through all that way, personally, I would be selling, I would be aiming to sell products. I'd be aiming to build an email list. Social media is pretty good to build an email list. Um, so like on Twitter, you can pin your tweets and like put call to actions, for example, on Instagram, you have your bio links, etc. And people collect hundreds of leads from that. So it's like, I, and you don't have to do this for sure when you build the site, but it's something I would try to incorporate in what we do. And then it's like, all of a sudden this become, you become a content creator, not just like an SEO guy trying to game the to game the system, but a content creator with a pretty fucking good edge on SEO that's going to to help your your growth. But you're still fitting within the model that um, most platforms are trying. The model of content creator that most platforms are trying to push forward, not the guy who's gaming the system, basically. So we're about a year or so past the end of what for most people has been, you know, lockdowns and pandemic and, and that kind of stuff. And we're still sort of feeling ripples of that. Um, you know, there are a lot of industries which completely shut down. I'm thinking like travel, um, which have bounced back and are now really, really strong. The, the demand for um, overseas vacations and that kind of thing is, is huge. And that's had, you know, ripple effects into uh, other industries as well. Um, I remember there was a, a guy in, in one of our courses who had a, a bike site reviewing um, mountain bikes and things like that, race bikes. Um, and there was a real problem because there was none available on Amazon or anywhere else. Um, and there's real stock shortages. But now they've kind of like bounced back a lot. And um, in some cases, there's a bit of an oversupply of, of certain products and in, in certain niches. So um, th we're still not at that kind of like equilibrium level where everything is kind of back to normal. Um, and that's like before you factor in recession, economics and uh, everything there. Um, so I think it's just worth thinking, you know, how can you um, benefit from the, the kind of ongoing ripple effects further down the line? You know, I'm going to talk about this later, but one of the examples from from parenting is, you know, there was a lot of people saying, oh, people are going to have a lot of kids during or just at the end of the, the pandemic. And that didn't really transpire um, according to kind of the studies, but what did happen was that younger people had start, were having fewer kids then, but older people um, were having more kids then, and older parents have more disposable income, and that kind of affects um, the way they spend money and, and all that in different ways. So yeah, it's just something to, to sort of take into consideration uh, about what's hot you know, right now as you're starting a new site, but is that still going to be the case in one or two years time? People people may want to travel a lot right now, but at the end of this year, as you know, budgets really start to tighten, overseas vacation is usually one of the first things to uh, to go, isn't it? Yeah, let's see how. I mean, the thing as well is like you need to be a little careful on basing your niche selection on trends because sometimes it takes some time to take off. So it's like you can use trends to grow. And I'll talk about one, tr like I picked one niche in my examples about trends and one niche that's kind of like more evergreen. 
uh, kind of go through rational of that, but yeah, it's like you need it's a factor without it being like the main factor. I say. Uh, I'm looking at everyone here who started a crypto site uh, two three <laughs> years ago. You know. Before we go to examples, I wanted to actually go through basically the main ways that we're going to change the way we build sites, uh, and basically how that's going to affect niche research in a way. Uh, the first one is like, we're, I mean, I'm personally using AI for content research and as a planning assistant a lot, right? So it's like an example of that is quite often I'll just write quick notes about an idea of content I have. So like I actually feed it my insights, like for example, for this podcast, I would say, you know, recession, Maslow pyramid, uh, health West relationship, uh, things like that. I'll just feed it all of that and I'll be like, okay, brainstorm me talking points for the podcast and it would just come, me, come with like a clean list of like things and expand it, etc. And that is quite useful. So it's not about having it create the content, it's about having it help me plan the content and expand my thoughts without me having to write a lot and type a lot, etc. It's just this. Um, I like to use it to mimic the style of competitors as well. So like quite like for example, uh, mentioned by Andin earlier, I think his writing style for Backlinko was really good. Um, and so you can actually feed intros from a site you like very much and write your thoughts about like what you want in an intro for yours and then say, write an intro in the same style as the examples I pasted before with that information I gave you. And then if you don't want AI content on your site, just rewrite it yourself, but it's going to give you something pretty good that is matching that style, for example. So that, that kind of stuff. And another thing I use it for as well is for summarizing articles in research. So let's say you're researching a topic you're gonna to be talking about. So I don't know, maybe you researched the probabilities of a recession for this podcast, right? And you Google that and then you got a huge article on Financial Times that is like 3000 words and you're like, fuck, I have the podcast in 20 minutes. <laughs> and then you just copy paste the article in the AI tool and you're like, okay, write me a 10 bullet point summary of this article and what are the main takeaways and bam, 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 you get exactly what it says without having to read the whole thing. Um, and you don't need to go super in detail, for example. I, That's I, how I, you say I think the, the key though there is, um, it's often presented as, okay, you could just take those 10 bullet points and speak those out in the podcast or put those in your article. But there's still that human layer that you, the creator, need to to take and you know discard some of the, the points that it makes because they won't be relevant or make sense and then choose the right right ones. But in terms of getting started with the idea generation, it's, it's invaluable. Yeah, so like using AI for content like that, so, so like that's something I'm doing with like, people that are creating content for us. It's like, I have calls with them, like, oh, like here's stuff I'm doing and here's how to speed up your work, etc. Um, but they're still expected to do their work, right? It's like, and, and I don't expect them to work less or anything like that. I just expect to just save a bunch of time using this. So it's like, it's more like that. And I don't think you'll be in trouble with Google working like that, using this for research, etc. Probably the content, the final content you put on your site is fully edited by you, even quite often fully written by you. Uh, it's just the cliff notes maybe were helped with AI, basically. So that's one. The second one is a higher focus on UX. Um, so I think that Again, with the growth of the AI content stuff, et cetera, like people want that information fast and they don't necessarily want to read a whole blog post to get the answer to a question. I think that's probably one of the most common um, kind of like complaints I saw about people and about Google when the chat GPT would just give them the answer without having to open web, shitty web pages, et cetera. And so, and so like the idea is that you can probably create a better experience for people to get their information quicker on the pages. And quite often that requires you reworking like blog, WordPress and blog posts, et cetera. They're not always the best way to do this by default. And reworking the way pages look uh, with like tables on top that just summarize the information, TLDR sections, things like that can really help making better website that I think will perform better as it's really quite evident that that's what the public wants at this point, you know? So I completely agree with you, first of all. But as a publisher, how do you balance that with what Google is rewarding? So I'm thinking specifically for recipes, right? Then um, you TLDR, you TLDR on top. Like basically you make several layers of your article. Like it's kind of like a pyramid. <laughs> it's like you could get the 80, 20, just reading the, the first like 20, but basically 20% 20 of the page, you get 80% of the value. And then if you read the whole page, then you get more value basically. So it's like, maybe you can write about the origin of this recipe and things like that lower on the page, but you give like all the practical stuff right at the top. So people can, can consume that. And then you essentially, like people can leave your page as, as early as they find the information they were looking for. 
So that kind of stuff. And reworking your headers, not putting like massive featured images, like so you don't have to scroll to get the information. Um, lots of things like that can be like can be worked on to give a better experience. And uh, given given recent feedback on this AI stuff, etc., I believe Google's gonna look a little bit deeper into like what experience people get to get their information. Like that's gonna be one of their takeaways, basically. And the third point is uh, we mentioned it earlier: focus on on content authenticity. So like focus more on like hands-on review. Focus more on making actual stuff that you know cannot be written by AI that uh, shows that you've really used the product or shows experience because now you're allowed to do this etc um, but also like be a bit practical about this like you can't all, always buy every product you're going to review you can't always um, have experience about everything and quite often you, you go to a doctor he's talking they're talking about stuff that they've never properly had experience with just stuff they read in a book basically you know um, and so like I think it's quite important that um, to kind of bring the, pra the practical aspect into this. And so, for example, I mentioned this site a million times, so I'm going to do it one more time, but these Hoopskit guys who summarize YouTube videos that have hands-on reviews on this mixed with real hands-on reviews of products, for example, is probably something that we're going to do um, so that all our articles are inspired by hands-on review. Some of it will be direct hands-on, some of it will be indirect hands-on. Uh, it adds the authenticity that is it's harder to fake. And at the same time, it's a little bit practical in terms of like, you don't have to buy every product in your niche to build a website, which I don't think many people are gonna do. And we need to also address for people basically. So that's basically the three main things. Now let's jump into the examples. I'll start with one that is kind of a classic example of a pretty good niche site. That's going to be a horse riding site that I would actually be building. Uh, why horse riding? Well, there's, the Forbes doesn't talk about horse riding very much, first of all. So I'm avoiding the big guys. Uh, lots of info keywords. So uh, for example, what is the fastest horse? What is the biggest horse breed? These kind of keywords have actually lots of search volume. And so you can monetize these with ads, as we mentioned earlier. But there's also a lot of expensive items that you can either promote as an affiliate. There's, there's few affiliate programs in that niche, let's be honest, but there is some. Uh, I've checked it out. Uh, but most importantly, if I was going to this niche, I would actually aim to eventually own the store eventually, like because it's a smaller niche. Uh, sell like expensive Western saddles. You know, Western saddle can probably cost more than two grand quite often, actually, wow. for example. Like <laughs> they're really expensive. And also you need a lot of items because it's full leather, right? So you need to maintain it, etc. Like there's lots of uh, it's actually quite technical to do. I used to do this when I was a kid. Um, so yeah, it's actually like Eventually, I would try to do something more like what Kevin did with Epic Gardening, but for uh, for like saddles and horse riding items, etc., mixed with uh, content uh, that is monetized with ads. And an example of a site that I found that doesn't have the shop yet, but they actually have the reviews and they have the ads, that is a horse riding sense.com. They are 44 and they get uh, 285,000 traffic. So that gives you an idea that it looks like a small niche, but there's actually uh, a fair amount of traffic to be getting in this niche. You're avoiding the big publishers. You have the dual monetization opportunities with the opportunity to go to own the site. I mean, eventually, if you actually own the shop, etc., I think it can be a seven-figure business uh, eventually. So yeah, that is my first example. Uh, okay, the next one I've got is the parenting niche. Uh, so I alluded to this earlier. Um, maybe uh, some ripple effects from, from COVID and um, more older parents having uh, children these days um, with disposable money, disposable income um, and less energy to spend on parenting their children. So looking for hacks and ways to make that whole process easier. Um, but also, if you remember what we said about uh, double EAT or EEAT, the experience factor becoming um, more of a thing then if you're a parent yourself, you already have a ton of experience as a parent and being a parent. And that's very valuable to someone um, who is a new parent or is going through this for the, for the first time. Um, and uh, it's very easy to demonstrate your, your expertise and therefore your authority and therefore build trust um, by just being a parent yourself and being sort of conscious of what's going on there. Furthermore, um, we, we have talked about you know, going more into the ads space, looking for info keywords. Um, perhaps they're less competitive than a review of a stroller or something like that. Um, there are a lot of info keywords around, you know, how to 
parent how to raise your children how to teach them things how to discipline them all these different techniques and um, ways of of um, imparting wisdom and controlling them and be- making them behave um, can be taught can be uh, taught and there's a lot of keywords a lot of volume for that there's a, a good site it's called parentingforbrain.com um, which is run by some pretty smart people um, I believe the, the owner went to Harvard but not as a psychologist or yeah, anything don't. qualified like that they're just relying on their, their kind of expertise rather than their you know qualifications to to write this content uh and you know the site it's okay it's like four or five years old now it's dr63 but it gets 300k traffic and it's not that well seo optimized it's not that uh, fancy of a site either like it, anyone listening to this podcast could build this yeah yeah uh so lots of strong uh, ads potential there and even further down the line uh, strong info product potential on mm-hmm. you know yeah. courses if you want to make like a video course for new parents or for parents of teenagers or something like that then huge huge potential there um so yeah uh quite like that as a niche yeah okay so my last example is kind of like a gut feeling niche rather than like something that i can put uh, metrics behind but it's kind of a discussion we had with mark when he came here I tend to like share this stuff sometimes in the podcast but like well, i was like look when we built a toy hacker like I couldn't have done keyword research and just tell you like that was that was would back it up. Like you kind of get this gut feeling on like big trends that are coming up, right? People were talking about one dollar a day AdSense sites when we started this, not uh, building bigger sites, and eventually this trend that we went behind kind of got bigger. And so I I personally believe that uh, there's the no code movement on one side, which is basically the idea that you can build apps and products without coding anymore by combining things like, you know, Notion and like uh, Coda and like Airtable and then like Zapier and then plug all these things together and build like MV- the MVP of a product without knowing how to code and then eventually you make a coded version when you actually have proven the concept. Um, and so, and uh, on the other side, I think AI productivity is going to be a big one. So kind of like a site that would do a mix of both. And I found someone that is kind of close to that. He doesn't really do AI productivity, but he does um, kind of like no code and uh, productivity in general. And that is Thomas Frank. So Thomas Frank is a big YouTuber. He has big YouTube channels. He has one YouTube channel that has 2.78 million subscribers. And other one that is called Thomas Frank Explains that we've used a lot recently because we're switching to Notion. Well, he literally talks about Notion across the whole channel. And he has 117,000 subscribers, uh, which is quite impressive for focusing on a single tool. But not, not only that, but I was like, okay, if you go on his site, it's not very impressive. Like he has like 12K traffic, etc. It's mostly a place for him to sell his Notion templates. So it's, it's not really an SEO play. He's trying, but hasn't succeeded yet. But then I was like, okay, can you actually do SEO in this niche, right? Can you find keywords that would drive decent traffic that I could then use to like sell templates on uh, Notion or other tools or like productivity, productivity framework, or prompts for AI, things like that, right? First of all, I, I discovered there's actually a marketplace for AI prompts this morning that actually exists now. So you can come up with a, a smart prompt and sell it for two bucks per, per copy, basically. People buy that. Um, but that is not uh, what you would do here. But like the examples of keywords, for example, I found how to f- change fonts in Notion. And the top site has 200, 382 traffic and is in the DR30s, basically. I found how to embed Google Calendar in Notion, 500 traffic for DR24 on the first position, for example, and a bunch of others. So you could be actually getting a decent amount of high quality traffic that cares about these apps. And that's just Notion, right? It could be ClickUp, but it could also be OmniFocus, for example. It's a big uh, to-do thing on Mac, for example. It could be um, Todoist, for example. Like I could write keywords about this, etc. What you need to be a bit careful when you write about these things that are uh, particular to products is that you're not competing with the product website itself to rank for this. So the keywords I selected, Notion didn't rank for them. But for some of the keywords, Notion did rank for it. But still, you can apply a fit program, a lot of these tools have a fit programs and you can get recurring commissions. You can apply you can apply the info keywords plus ads or plus email list building in that case. For my for me, I would probably be building a list and selling templates, things like that, like these guys are doing. Um, but overall, like I just want to, to, to pick that niche because why it doesn't seem to be the strongest case. You know, sometimes you recognize a trend that you believe is going to go up and sometimes it's good to kind of invest in these early while the numbers are not necessarily showing in Google Trends or Ahrefs or something like this. You know, you go on social media, you see everyone's talking about this. You go on 
uh, you know, you see YouTube videos, everyone's talking about this, etc. Uh, you can jump into these kind of trending niches, provided you have something to add to that. And quite often, they can be some of the best niches uh, if you can add that layer of authenticity, I would say. So that's why I wanted to pick one of these. Just wanted to add as well that, you know, you talked about competing against the the site itself, the, the product itself. Um, often the resources they have, be that, that a features page or a support page, uh, it's not really the easiest to kind of like follow or or use. And sometimes having that impartial third party talk about a product in a more balanced way and not just hype it up the whole time um, can actually be beneficial. So often when I'm searching for how to do something on Notion, say I'm not clicking on the first result, I'm look, going to the, the first third party result. Yeah, so it's, I mean, yeah, it's, and a lot of people are looking for kind of like people to follow as well in these things. Yeah. Like if you use a tool like that, you, it's not the only question you have or will have. And so you have the opportunity to kind of like gain a long-term follower doing this. But yeah, it's like, I think sometimes you can ignore a lot of the rules, although here I could apply a lot of these. You can find fair programs, you can find uh, info content, you can put ads on, there's products that you could sell, etc. cetera. Uh, but sometimes it's worth ignoring these things and actually going for something that you feel can be big, provided you're actually passionate by it uh, and, and provided you're gonna live the lifestyle and be authentic. Because in these up and coming niches, people are looking for this authenticity for these real users, etc. You don't go in there as an SEO play. You go in there because you're ready to like actually get your hands dirty, basically. Uh, but if you are, uh, really, really good opportunity. So that's pretty much it for my last example. Uh, any final words of wisdom um, or you're too hangover for that? Um, I'm not hungry for at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks for listening, guys. We actually have the authority system that is on sale right now for the next few days, basically to celebrate New Year. So go on authorityhacker.com slash system. If you want to check out the offer, it's only going to be open for like two or three more days, I think. And we're going to wrap this up after. So don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to subscribe, like, and we'll see you again in two weeks. Bye.